You're killing me, Smalls. You play ball like a girl. Oh my god, that's the same guy? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Today's video will be reviewing The Sandlot from 1993. This year marks the 30th anniversary when The Sandlot came out. Not to sound like a broken record saying this, this movie came out the year I was born. Pretty soon, my video I just made recently on movies that came out the year I was born will be uploaded on my birthday. Also, I just want to say, two months ago, Yankee pitcher Domingo Herman pitched the perfect game. Hats off to you and congratulations. But sadly, he's in rehab, recovering alcoholic. I hope he does okay, recovers, and does better. But sadly, the Yankees suck this year. Thanks a lot, Aaron Boone. A few years ago in 2017, when watching Yankee games, some of the Yankee ballplayers did reenactment scenes from the movie as a commercial. Like when Scott Smalls finding out, seeing the connection that Babe Ruth's nickname was the Great Bambino. Also in 2013, for the 20th anniversary of this movie, I remember like random MLB All-Star players quoted the movie for celebrating the movie's anniversary. The Sandlot is a coming-of-age sports comedy movie. The plot of The Sandlot is about a kid named Scott Smalls who moves from out of town with his mom and stepdad. Smalls has a hard time making friends. He's not a good baseball player. He meets a kid named Benjamin Rodriguez who teaches him how to play baseball, and he gets better with practice over time. One summer day, Smalls has a baseball signed autograph by Babe Ruth. He stole from his stepdad's collection. His friends try to get that signed baseball back, but a big giant beast stops him from getting the baseball back. I may have said this before in one of my past videos. I'm a huge diehard baseball fan. It's my favorite sport. To me, it's the greatest sport ever, in my own personal opinion. I am a huge diehard fan of the New York Yankees. This movie, Angels in the Outfield, Rookie of the Year, my first love for baseball. This movie is also my first intro to knowing about who Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig was. The 1927 New York Yankees murderous rogue team. The Great Bambino. If you never saw this movie, this is a movie that is always quoted by movie and baseball fans. This movie is also one of my favorite childhood movies. I'm very nostalgic for this movie. With so many different baseball movies, it's hard for me to describe why this is so special nostalgia for me. My first view of this movie was in 2002 when I was 9 years old. And this is around the time my grandma just passed away. And my parents bought this for me on VHS tape at the time despite it was not Christmas or my birthday yet. I honestly cannot tell you why they got this for me on VHS tape as a gift at that time for me. After seeing this movie, I loved it, and I was really into this movie and hooked. I love the story, the kid actors, and I still do to this day. Seeing this movie as a kid in 2002, this is way before the internet was the way it is now. This is before I knew about what year I was born. In 2002, there was no Google yet or social media. It also did not occur to me how as a kid watching this movie, it took place in a different time period in the 1960s, way before my time, way before I was born. As a kid, I did not understand different time periods, how life was different before I was born. And obviously, I wasn't alive in the 1960s, but I met people who lived through the 1960s, telling me their point of view, how times were different, and what life was like compared to today's modern world of growing up as a youth. I saw a meme on Facebook with Hallie back in the 90s when this movie came out. It took place in the 60s. It this came out today, like in the modern day 2020s, it would take place in the 90s. Which I can see that at the same time, I don't want this film ever remade. Leave it alone. Besides this movie being about baseball, it's a good coming of age movie on growing up, being a new kid in town. Moving to a new town and having a hard time finding a group of friends that blend in, who you feel connected to, and have common interests. It can be hard to find and make new friends when you move to a new place in life. I love the kid actors they are good in this movie. This movie is like The Goonies and Stand By Me as a baseball movie. It's also been compared to The Bad News Bears with similar character arc personalities, but a little more kid-friendly than The Bad News Bears. I've never seen The Bad News Bears, but I know about that movie with Walter Matthau. My favorite kid was obviously Scott Malls and between Benny Rodriguez. I seem to go back and forth between uh, those two of who my favorite character in this movie is. I can really understand how hard it is to make friends and blend in a group. The difference is I never moved to a new town as a kid growing up. can also really identify how like not being the best baseball player like anything else. How to start from the bottom, how to practice. And I also really liked how Benny Rodriguez, who looks like a young Alex Rodriguez, despite not being a fan of A-Rod, but that's a different story.
Benny's that one friend we all had growing up who made a difference in our lives to help build confidence. He's like the River Phoenix character in Stand By Me. I like when he teaches me how to play baseball. After a few basic simple tricks on Benny, smallest fight learns how to play baseball. He improves and performs better. The chemistry between Tom Guyrie and Mike Vitar is very good. You really believe and are convinced that they are best friends. When we were first introduced to Scott Smalls, it's funny after not having a good run at the Sandlot, his mom calls him in his room telling him to get out make friends and not sit around all summer in his room. She tells him to climb trees, run around, get dirty, get into some trouble. But not a lot of trouble, some trouble. She gives him her permission. She asks Scott, how many mothers say that? Um, none. My mom told me the opposite. She told me never get into trouble and stay out of trouble. <laughs> but I get what Scott's mom is saying was that go out, have fun, do things a regular kid would do. Also, she did not want him to stay in his room all summer and play with his science toys. She basically wants her son to be a stereotypical kid. I can remember when my mother telling me not to sit in my room all day and not watch TV all day. That's why she sent me to summer camp. But it all worked out all right. The mother was played by Karen L. You might recognize as Claire from Indiana Jones. She was also an Animal House. And Bill Murray Scrooged. I met her in 2013. She was very nice. His stepdad was played by Dennis Leary. The grown-up Scott narrates how that his real dad passed away a few years ago. His mother remarried. There was some estrangeness. Not that one or the other hated each other. It's a learning experience for both of them trying to adjust. Bill was learning how to be a father figure to Scott, and Scott was trying to adjust to having a new dad in his life. Funny how seeing Dennis Lair in this movie and other familiar names, they're not the main stars of this movie. This was also Dennis Larry's early years in film and TV show Rescue Me. Prior to this, he was known for a stand-up comedy routine. His character is a Yankee fan. In real life, Dennis Larry is a Boston Red Sox fan. My guess is maybe because Babe Ruth played for Boston before being a Yankee. is why he played this part. But then again, you can't send opportunities when you're starting your career at playing a fictional character who was a Yankee fan. Bill tried to teach him to play baseball. Sky got hits in the eye by accident as a black guy. When he accidentally steals his signed autographed baseball signed by Babe Ruth, the moral lesson is Scott Smalls learns never take someone's own stuff without asking, and also never play with a signed baseball autograph without asking permission first. But then again, don't play with a uh, signed baseball or sports memorabilia in general, period. When the ball is hit over the fence, this is where the movie gets crazy. They tried many attempts at fail to get the ball back from starting base to using a broomstick, tying Yeah Yeah to a rope, a vacuum cleaner, or Scott Small Science Experiment. What's funny is they don't mention or explain like which kid's vacuum they stole from their parents. There wasn't a scene where the, like, the one kid's parent yelled and freaked out on them. See, this part makes me think if I stole or used my mom's vacuum as a kid thinking that it was a toy, and if it got broken, my mom would have killed me. <laughs> The vacuum explodes. That was the most dangerous of them all. I don't know how much vacuums cost back in the 60s, but they are probably way more today than they were back in the 60s. Seeing the kids trying to get the ball back was kind of funny, but it was too risky and crazy at the same time for what they go through. In a way, it felt like a Looney Tunes slapstick comedy. Benny Rodriguez loved baseball. It was his favorite thing in the world. Benny's the big all-star player of this movie. As the adult Smalls narrates said on the 4th of July narration baseball for benny was life the old fox commercials i live for this benny lived for this anytime fourth of july comes around that firework game night sequence something about that is so magical and special for me seeing the kids play baseball benny hits the ball and they see how cool the fireworks are anytime i see fireworks the scene always comes to mind Benny does not make fun or insult Smalls. He believed in it and taught him his simple strategies on how to play baseball. Lesson Benny taught Smalls, have fun, it's baseball, relax. Wish I had a friend like Benny when I was a kid growing up. The dream sequence that Benny has was where Babe Ruth tells him to hop over the fence and get the baseball back. He's afraid because of this big giant beast. Babe Ruth tells him that this is a sign of destiny of being a legend. Before Babe Ruth leaves the dream, he looks at Hank Aaron's baseball card and he says, Henry Aaron, I don't know why, can I keep this? A foreshadow that he would break Babe Ruth's record in 1974. Rest in peace, Hank Aaron. You are still the home run king, not Barry Bonds. 
Seeing Benny run away from the beast is intense and crazy. As a kid watching this scene when Benny runs away from the beast with a baseball, he runs into a small movie theater. They're watching Lon Chaney Jr.'s Universal's The Wolfman. As a kid, I'm like, it's the Wolfman movie. My first thought was, how many kids my age have seen this movie know that that was the Wolfman movie was? As I said before, as a little kid watching the Universal Monsters, I used to think I was alone in this universe, thinking I was the only one who knew about the Universal Monsters. It's funny how before we see the Beast look like a regular dog, he looked like Cujo or something out of a B-movie horror. As a kid watching this movie, I was shocked to see how the Beast was just a regular dog. When Betty comes face to face against the Beast, I didn't understand how I was a kid watching this. This was the point of view from a little kid's perspective. Sometimes little kids can be afraid of dogs. I know, I was one of them. Now I love dogs. Also, kids have different viewings on how they see things differently than adults do. Despite the famous movie quote I said earlier in this video, this will surprise you what my favorite line in this movie is. When Benny's about to hop over the fence to get the ball back, come face to face with the bees, he thinks about what Babe Bruce said to him in the dream. Remember kids, there's heroes and legends. Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Follow your heart, kid, and you'll never go wrong. That line has stood me ever since I saw this movie as a kid. I'm being a legend, something in my life, in my own ways. It's also one of my go-to motivational quotes. Benny's dream we all wish we could have meeting our idols. I've had dreams meeting famous actors that are not alive anymore. Or heck, even fantasize about being friends with them, but it's true they say, never meet your idols, you'll be disappointed. Benny grows up living his dream playing for the Los Angeles Dodgers. The movie ends where he steals home to win a ball game. The actor who played the adult Benny was Mike Vitar's real-life brother. He looks just like him. Also, Smalls is a baseball announcer for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Besides Benny and Smalls being the main characters of this movie, as I said before, I like the other kid actors in this movie. Hamilton and the Bay of Ham Porter, an overweight kid catcher you compare to the kid from Goonies, Chunk, or August Augustus Gloop as a baseball player. He likes to eat a lot. The character is funny but can be a jerk to small sometimes. Like Smalls had no idea what a s'mores was. Heck, that was the first time I learned what a s'mores was myself from this movie. Anytime summer's around the corner, I can't say no to having s'mores on camping trips or just sitting by a fire on a nice summer night. His nickname is Hamilton Babe Ham Poor is obviously a homage to Babe Ruth when you think about it. Anytime Smalls did not know something, he gets annoyed and mad easily. It's like, dude, calm down. Like, we're supposed to know everything. <laughs> when he quotes the great Bambino, Smalls did not know anything about baseball. He lies, pretending he knows who Babe Ruth was. He thought he said the great Bambi. Heck, this modern-day age probably doesn't even know who Babe Ruth is, unless you're a diehard baseball fan like I am. Thanks to the steroid era, this modern-day age of baseball fans talk more about Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Alex Rodriguez... Jose Canseco and Roger Clemens, the most hated, cheated baseball players ever in the history of the game. These guys were talented baseball players from the start of their careers, but took the steroids and pushed the edge to get better and break home run records. Cheaters. Squint's a nerdy kid who wears glasses. He has a crush on Wendy Prefercorn, the prettiest girl in town. Squint pretends to drown. Wendy's doing CPR on him, then he kisses her. This scene would not fly today. And they would not get away with a scene like this today either. One of the characters, like maybe around 16 or 17, and Squints, I'm guessing, was 10 to 12 maybe. I'm not sure what ages the kid characters were in this movie. They don't explain that. But still, point is, that scene would not fly today. The funny part is, the adult Smalls narrates how that he says they end up getting married, having nine kids, and they own Vincent's drugstore. Yikes. Squint tells a scary story of the Beast and Mr. Myrtle being a bad person, and he let the Beast eat a kid. He says his grandfather was the police that stopped the crime. The campout scene where the kids tell a story reminds us of when we were kids, you would tell scary stories that night before going to bed. Again, I love the campout scene with Smalls and his friends. Brings back good memories to me and good times when I was a kid. Alan Yeah Yeah, his famous catchphrase in this movie is saying Yeah Yeah all the time. Just like Porter, he makes fun of Smalls, but becomes friends with him after seeing him get better as a baseball player. His legacy is he goes to the military school after his army career became a pioneer in bungee jumping. Tommy and Timmy, 
two kids that are not twins, the one kid, Tommy, repeats Timmy's words all the time. They grew up inventing mini malls and became rich. Lucky son of a guns. Bertram, another kid who wore glasses, just like Squints and the others. At first, he's not thrilled and not believe in Smalls could play ball until he sees him improve. His reaction is like, all right, let's play some ball. As I said before, when they would not get away with a 12-year-old kissing a 17-year-old girl in today's modern movies, here's another thing they would not get away with today either. After they won a game against some like Little League team that they hated, they go to a carnival to celebrate. Bertram had some chewing tobacco. He was saving for a special moment. Kids are not supposed to be chewing tobacco because it's bad for them. They go on a Ferris wheel ride and they get sick and throw up. The only one who doesn't get sick and throw up is Benny. He's lucky. Kenny De Nunez, a pitcher. Anytime I watch this movie, sometimes I compare the kid actors to MLB players, depending on who they look like. I'm not sure if this character was a homage to Satchel Paige. He wears a baseball cap, the Kansas City Monarchs, which was a real-life Negro League baseball team. He did pitch in the minor league, but he never made it to the big leagues. He grew up owning his own business and coached his own son's little league baseball team called the Heaters. I met one of the kid actors who played the pitcher, Brandon Adams. He was a kid actor in the 90s and was all over. He was in the Mighty Ducks. I hate to say this, I never saw that movie, but according to my parents, I did. But I don't have a photographic memory of watching that movie, honestly. He was also in Wes Craven's horror movie, The People Under the Stairs, and Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Someday I hope to meet some of the other Sandlot Kid actors. I'd like to meet Benny, Smalls, Porter, Alan Yaga, and Squints. This is a movie I love to watch once a year around the summertime, taking me back to when I was a little kid growing up, to a simple time to being a little kid. All I had to do was go to school, play sports, come home, do my homework, and watch cartoons. Enjoy nice summer days of playing outside with my friends until sundown. It also reminds me how I had similar friends like this growing up with each kid having unique personalities. Despite my generation was the video game era, we still went outside to play baseball and other sports for fun. The other thing I love about this movie is about the importance of friendship. Sometimes watch this movie like anyone who grew up with a group of friends when you were 12, 13 years old. Life goes on. The kids you grew up with you haven't seen that group age since you were 12, 13 years old. Sometimes I wonder what happened to them after we all went our separate ways. Despite we live in an age of social media, but sadly I'll probably never see them again because I don't remember their last names off the top of my head. Also as a kid in our childhood, we all had a go-to place that we spent a lot of time going to for escapism and a sanctuary. That's something I could identify with. I had those places for me as a kid, as I said before my matinee movie review. Here's a little fact. The late Kobe Bryant loved this movie. He said he watched this movie every 4th of July. I'm not going to lie. I've done that sometimes too. But at least at some point I'll watch this movie when it's summertime. Even if it's not 4th of July. Especially during the baseball season I'll watch this movie. Unlike most sports movies, this movie does not have a championship final scene. Despite Ben and his gang face off against like some Little League baseball team they have a hatred towards. That's never explained on why that is. I love how the movie opens up with a monologue with an adult Scott Smalls narrating the story and telling his point of view story, how that summer of 1962 had an impact on him, and how that summer event made him the man who he is today. In my senior year of high school, we did an assignment on writing a letter to your future self, where we see ourselves in 10 years, and how that one event in our lives that happened 10 years plus made us who we are today. I honestly, I don't remember what I wrote, because at 17... You don't really have much real life experience until after high school. This could be a video in the future, an event life experience that may be who I am today. As mentioned earlier in this movie, it's like Stand By Me as a baseball movie. Smalls narrates what happens to the kids who grew up playing baseball in the Sandlot. Similar in Stand By Me, Grown Up Gordy narrates what happened to his friend at the summer of 1959. When the adult narrator Scott Smalls explains what happened to the kid, they fade away. The part where he mentions what happened to Bertram, the second baseman, he explains that he really got into the 60s and no one ever saw him again. My theory on that is he either died in Vietnam or maybe a drug overdose. James Earl Jones is Mr. Myrtle. Despite being a big movie star, being known as the voice of Darth Vader, 
He doesn't show up until the end of the movie. After all the fake rumors about him and his dog being killers, it turned out to be fake. We see that Mr. Merle's is a nice, sweet, old man and friendly. It turns out he was a baseball player and he's also a big baseball fan himself. He played against Babe Ruth and was friendly with Babe Ruth. He said he was a good baseball player, but he ended up going blind after getting hit by a ball by accident. It's funny how when they finally meet and confront Mr. Murr, and find out the stories about him were false. He says, next time I hop over the fence, I could have got you the baseball. The gang are mad at hitting squints like, you almost got us killed. And we went through hell to get that signed baseball autograph back. <laughs> It's nice when he offers Smalls a tray for the Babe Ruth autograph for the rest of the 1927 Murders Row New York Yankees to make up for ruin the autograph signed baseball signed by Babe Ruth. Despite Scott's stepdad was still mad about the signed autograph ball being chewed up and ruined, but he was happy to have a signed autograph baseball the 1927 New York Yankees. He got grounded for a week. After that, they got along better and had a better bond. Bill was okay with Scott calling him dad after a while. This had been James Earl Jones' second baseball movie because prior to this he played in Field of Dreams as Terrence Mann, a fictional civil rights activist recluse. They made two sequels to this movie. I never saw any of them. I can't make a comment on them. I know James Earl Jones is in the second movie, and the third one, no one from the first movie's back. I would probably never watch any of these movies ever in my life. No interest or desire. I heard the third one was okay and decent, but again, no thanks. This is a movie that did not need any sequels. I read the third one is like It's a Wonderful Life meets Back to the Future, where Scott Smalls wakes up as a kid again, relives his childhood. I don't know, sounds stupid to me. Despite the third Sandlot movie got a decent reception, surprisingly. Unless they did a reunion sequel with Scott Smalls, Benny Rodriguez, and the rest of the gang getting together with their kids for a reunion of the Sandlot that they used to play at, taking place in the late 80s or early 90s. Also, maybe Benny and Scott coach their kids' Little League baseball team, and then their sons become friends. I don't know. Who cares? Whatever. So that was my review of the Sandlot. Hope you liked it. See you next time. Right now, I'm going to go play some baseball. Let's play ball.